All right. So talking about your sleeping system. So while shelters are designed to keep you dry and black out the wind and other weather, such as rain and snow, they don't do much to retain heat. And that's where your sleep system comes in. Um, before you get into your sleeping bags and other fluffy things, though, we need to start from the ground up. First, if your shelter is a tent or rain fly, etc., or whatever it happens to be, um, and it doesn't have it covered, you need to have a vapor barrier between you and the ground. L uh, loose water is our enemy here, and keeping you dry should be your first priority. If you lose body heat to the ground and melt snow or ice or frost, then it becomes water and now you're damp. So a tarp um, can be what helps you there. Blue, brown, green, clear plastic, whatever, just use it. So we're gonna set our tarp up first. Get it all out. All right. If you set up your tarp directly on the snow, um, it could be a slippery situation. So keep that in mind before you hunker down. You, uh, you might be on the side of a hill and go for a little ride. Um, I've been there. You may have seen or you will see in some of our shelter videos that you also can use pine branches to help insulate and pad your ground. Um, side note, when you're done with your, your sleeping situation, you pack up and go home. It's fun to see what the ground looks like and see if you've melted any snow um, from your body heat, indicating that your sleeping pad was either good or bad. So starting off, some good uh, vapor barrier, tarp, bottom of your tent, shelter, whatever it happens to be. So next up, literally, is your pad. And there are several options here, but they all serve two main purposes, warmth and comfort. Comfort is secondary. It isn't a bedroom mattress or anything, but it's nice to have nonetheless. Most pad options will have what's called an R rating, which tells you their insulating value. The goal here is to keep your body heat up and avoid exchanging it with the ground below you. If you spend all night trying to warm up the earth, you're gonna lose every single time. Whatever your sleeping bag looks like, the underside isn't gonna help you very much as long as your body weight will just compress it and you'll lose pretty much all the insulation value in your bag. So for pads, you're gonna first start with inflatable or not. Now, non-inflatable pads can look as simple as uh, bed rolls, you know, your closed cell foam, um, like this example, or maybe even say a wool blanket, for instance. You can go ahead and just lay this out, one or two of them, and it may not be a mattress as far as, you know, comfort goes, but the, uh, the insulating value does exist. Um, some benefits to this type of mattress, the, uh, the closed cell foam ones, are that they're simple and they cannot be popped and deflate like with some other types. Um, this accordion style that I have here is probably one of my favorites because it's easy to use as a working surface in the winter. Um, you can use it as a seat in the snow. Any time of day, you can use it as a table, you can use it as a chair, headrest, a couch. Um, they even sell a little butt-sized one too. So you can, uh, you can sit on that in the winter and be nice and comfortable. All right, one of the cheapest options might be to use a chunk of this um, kind of subfloor insulating, kind of like bubble wrap. You may have seen this as part of the, uh, the water bottle demonstration where I showed you the koozie. It's the exact same stuff. Um, whatever you choose, the R value is gonna um, tell you how much heat and how much uh, proverbial bang for your buck you get or pound slash volume of gear that you have to bring. All right, onto inflatable mattresses. So these have the added benefit of being in general a lot more comfortable in terms of mattress characteristics, as well as being lighter and um, on average more expensive and susceptible to popping. So keep that in mind and trust me, it does happen. Also of note, while some of these uh, will self-inflate, you'll always have to top them off with a blower 10 from your lungs and that hot air in the winter will contract, which means that you might have to add more air again right before you go to bed, AKA, Blow up these things well before you go to sleep. There's always um, the non-self-inflating pads too, like I've got this one right here. So speaking of self-inflating pads, a little pro tip, when you're at home, blow them up, store them fully inflated so that they uh, maintain their self-ability, their self-inflating ability, and have a long and healthy life. So I've got a few examples of, of inflatable pads here. From this thin one that I've showed you, this is a Thermarest, very popular. This uh, more expensive, lighter weight Neo Air. These actually have some, uh, some like baffles inside to prevent, you know, uneven air distribution or heat transfer. To this really ridiculously thick air mattress that uh, is like two and a half inches thick. Really, really comfortable. Um, notice none of these are the, the hotel room, you know, family vacation, 
three feet thick air mattresses. Those are just silly. We don't take those on campouts. Um, now, insulating air value. Um, these mattresses are similar to the closed cell foam ones. They're going to have some, some ratings on them that you can go through and you can look up. Um, cheaper ones may be a little less effective. That air gap that you have inside um, may not have the insulating value that you expect, so make sure you definitely check beforehand. So I do like my huge, thick blue air mattress here because while it may be heavy, it's also wide by a very large margin, and I'm not going to roll off of it. Um, being that it's heavier and much, much larger to pack, it is relegated to car camping as opposed to backpacking. So for backpacking, I definitely prefer the lightweight Neo Air, which is, of course, also not the cheapest option either. So both are great for any season. Both can be graded on their R value, and just like um, the closed cell foam, both have... Uh, both have some great insulating properties. All right, so as with any gear techniques that I've talked about today, it's always best to go out and practice your gear first, or at least have a backup plan on your first camp out should you learn their system isn't quite what you were counting on, because the worst thing would be to be out in the cold and be really cold and not able to warm up at night. One final note and a slight departure is that if you're hammock camping in the winter, that is totally possible and totally comfortable, but the gear is slightly different. You can, in some gear situations, put a sleeping pad right inside your hammock, like one of these closed cell foam ones, or you can put it in a pocket that is beneath your hammock that is kind of built in. More commonly, a camper who is hammock camping will hang an under quilt right beneath the hammock. It's kind of like a quilt, but under you. Think of it like a blanket that has several attachment points can be fastened right beneath your hammock along the edge while you sleep. The key here is being under the hammock. Remember, you compress your sleeping bag when you're sleeping in it, so all of the bottom insulation is negated. If you hang insulation beneath you, the problem is solved and the underquilt is not being compressed. Science. Okay, on to the most popular part, the sleeping bags. So sleeping bags come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Just like with pads, sleeping bags have a rating and it's usually in the form of two temperatures. The higher of the two temperatures is your comfort rating and the lower of the numbers is usually your keep you alive rating, AKA less comfortable but safe. Please note that if your bag has only one number, it's usually the keep you alive rating and you may find it less than pleasant if you assumed that it was gonna be good enough alone to make you happy and comfortable on a camp out. We'll talk about ways to manage that in a minute, but first, some shapes. So the two common uh, shapes that you might encounter would be a rectangle and a mummy bag. My pad's out of the way here. So a rectangle bag is just that. It is a sleeping bag and it is in the shape of a rectangle. So as you can see here, my hanger sticking out, the sleeping bag is square at the bottom, come on up, square at the top. And conveniently, it's got this nice little kind of head enclosure pillow thing, but this is a rectangle bag. A rectangle bag will have more space inside of it for you to move around. There's also a lot more bag to pack up, so it is physically larger and making it kind of heavier in general. But most importantly, there's more air space inside for you to warm up. In general, these make better summer bags. The extra material tends to be down by your feet where you have um, much less body fat and uh, core temperature to warm up. So your feet may not uh, take care of this area quite as efficiently as you'd like. To contrast that, you might have a mummy bag. So the mummy bag is in the shape of a sleeping human being and it's got much less space inside. So you're more confined, but you're also on average warmer. On the downside, if you have to be comfortable uh, sleeping in a tight wrap, you may have a hard time. Some technology to point out in these bags would be the foot box down here, which may be slightly bulged out to allow your feet to exist in a more natural orientation, pointed up, not pointed down. Uh, they also have cinch cords to allow you to close the bag up around your face. More on that later. See the cinch cord right here. As well as often a second cinch point inside the bag to prevent the baffle effect. You can see another one right in here, which is down inside the bag. Again, more on that later. Very important though, for these to function, you actually have to Velcro everything together properly. And if you've never done that before, it will matter in the winter. Here we go. So what is this baffling problem that you may ask? So imagine this, every time you move in your sleeping bag, all zipped up and everything, 
every time you move, you kind of raise and lower and roll around and inflate and deflate the bag. And all of this, you know, inflating and deflating sucks cold air in and pushes warm air back out. And that will obviously make you cold. So this baffle thing, this, uh, this kind of secondary cinch that goes kind of down around your shoulders and below your neck helps prevent that. It keeps this, uh, it kind of like is an extra cinch point to prevent a huge amount of air transfer in and out of your bag while you're sleeping. Now back to the more important cinch point, of course, and that's the one that goes around your head. Got to Velcro that down, make sure you're all zipped up and everything. This is also helps keep the, whole, the cold air out and keep the warm air in, but it also gives you a leg up when it comes to keeping your head on the right spot. One of the worst things you can do is to sleep with your head inside your bag. Going way back to the points about keeping dry, every breath you take sends more moisture out and it's quite a bit. It's literally water going wherever you breathe. So unless you want to be wet and spending that precious energy warming up all the water all night long, you want to make sure that your head is outside of your sleeping bag breathing into your shelter. Also, of course, I advocate wearing a hat at night and that comes shortly. So as you can see here, you can cinch this guy right up around your head. We'll probably have a little bit of a video demo of this in a few and um, sleep nice and warm. Okay, so we have some bags here to show if these two simple examples that I showed you before are all that you have available at home, it doesn't mean that you have to go and buy something high-tech and you can't winter camp. Just like with clothing, layers are your friend. and You can add a blanket to your sleeping bag or even add a sleeping bag to your sleeping bag. Take this sleeping bag, put it inside of the other one. Now you've got layers. For extra added warmth, but a little more difficulty in getting in and out of bed, you can make sure that the zippers and openings are on opposite sides and don't overlap, allowing you to keep even more warm air in and cold air out. So zipper over here, zipper over there. And if you're not using a second sleeping bag and just a blanket, you can obviously unroll this thing inside or outside depending on how scratchy the wool might be. So I've got some examples here of down blankets and quilts. Pull these guys out here. And they're contrast to all of these polyfill sleeping bags that I've been showing you. This here is just a down quilt. It is immensely lighter than the sleeping bags. So down does have some pros and cons. Um, down does tend to be lighter, like I said. The down bags tend to be much more expensive. Um, and maybe a little harder to maintain and dry out when they get wet. The temperature rating can vary. This is an extremely thin down bag, um, so it's not going to be quite as warm as a, uh, as a thicker one, but it is definitely a lot lighter than a comparable sleeping bag made a, with a polyfill. Speaking of layers, here's a sleep system that is designed for just that. There's actually three layers in here, three different parts that snap directly together. There's an inner winter thicker heavy sleeping bag. There's kind of an intermediate summer layer. You can see there's uh, individual zippers. And then of course there's an, even an outer bivy sack. This doesn't follow the alternating zipper principle that I talked about, but it is of course layering just like we recommend with your clothes. Now this outer layer here is made out of Gore-Tex. So it is um, breathable yet waterproof, and this could actually serve as your shelter. In fact, you could use this as your entire shelter, take your sleeping pad and slide it right inside of one of the layers underneath your sleeping bag still, and you can sleep right in this guy all by itself. Um, benefit, it is camouflaged, so you'll be invisible. Um, downside, it is kind of tight, and good luck getting dressed inside of one of these things in the morning. It's fun to watch from the outside. Finally, here's what I use in the winter. So, take a look how big this thing is. Once again, this is a car camping only. This is heavy. This is quite large, but it is also extremely comfortable. So what I do is, um, get this thing out first. Got a pile of sleeping bags going on here. All right. 
So, so this bag is massive. It's a square bag. I know that there's more airspace down here, of course, but this is thick. This is heavy. This is actually rated to negative 25 degrees. Now, of course, that's a survival temperature, but that's setting you up for a pretty comfortable night nonetheless. Of course, inside we've got some technology, like we've got our two drawstrings, we've got our head one, we've got our baffle one, all the Velcros. So I like to set myself up for success. Um, right here in my sleeping bag stuff sack, I don't just have a sleeping bag. I pack all kinds of extra things. So I've actually got a second uh, blanket here that I could use for extra warmth or a pillow or whatever I want to do. I have in here an entire second set of clothes for the morning. So I've got my shirt, got my socks, got the underwear. It is very important to put on a complete dry set of clothes. Whether you'd like to admit it or not, you've been sweating all day in the clothes, at, um, your base layer and the layers that are right on top of it, of course, and none of that has any place being inside your sleeping bag under any circumstances. You may think it's warm, but get rid of it. That goes for your snow pants and your jacket too. So look, they may be warm when you're wearing them and when you're awake and moving around, but if you go ahead and wear that stuff in your sleeping bag, you'll basically be auditioning for the role of Frosty the Cold Man all night long. So I personally have a set of nice warm fuzz, fuzzy socks inside. These things are clutch. They're actually too big to wear in my boots, so I just wear them in my sleeping bag and they're nice and happy in there. Sometimes I throw in a fleece pullover for my shoulders. It's a weird situation, but this sleeping bag is so warm that I don't even always use a cinch cord. I just like to have a little bit of air and this helps my shoulders a little bit. Some other things that I throw in there might be a dry hat. Here it is. And again, hat is 100% critical. You need to have some kind of a warm head thing, dry, to sleep in. I also have, let's see, I've got my indoor outdoor thermometer so I can brag about how low the temperature got. Can't forget the thermals. I've got my Christmas lights for some ambiance. And I've got a nice inflatable pillow here. If inflatable is not your scene, you can go ahead and you can take um, an example like this. This is a stuff sack that actually has a fleece liner on the inside. Fill this up with some dry clothes and you can sleep on this because it is a pillow. Um, another little tip, and I know our, our scouts may not be in this situation, but um, a battery pack for your cellular, cellular camera device. Batteries do not like the cold, so you gotta sleep with them and you know, it might be a good time to charge your camera up for the next day. If you leave it out in the cold, it is going to freeze and it is going to die. So some extra tips, if you don't have all this warm stuff or you need that little extra push to take the cold edge off, you can always chuck a hand warmer down inside the sleeping bag or two, little artificial heat going on, or it's also popular to fill a water bottle up with warm but not dangerously hot water. I suggest a Philmont water bottle. And that'll help keep you warm, a little sh you know, shared heat energy. When it cools down later, you could of course eject it from your sleeping bag, but it's a great idea to keep it in your sleeping bag so that you'll have some non-frozen water in the morning. Um, little talk about that in the water section, which you may or may not have already watched. All right, so to touch really quickly on hammock camping, you can of course use a regular sleeping bag in your hammock in the winter. Um, as long as you have a little bit of extra insulation on the bottom, um, it's critical to have that free and fluffy insulation not compressed down under you as well as on top of you because you, that's what you need to stay warm. Some sleeping bags have a small opening at the foot end as, long, uh, as well as the top to allow the hammock to go all the way through so that you're not sleeping on top of the insulation. It's hanging beneath you. Or, of course, you could have a series of quilts both above and below you, which we talked a tiny bit in the previous section. The point is, it works, and you can sleep in a hammock in every season. Apologies for the vertical video here, but I'm going to have to add a very important uh, concept when it comes to sleeping bags and sleeping systems, and that's what you do with them when you're not camping. Those uh, nice stuff sacks are really great and compact, but you're going to uh, mess up your sleeping bag and lose all of its fluff. So, best practice leave them open and airy in a closet or hanging something, or if need be, maybe throw them in a big laundry bag, but do not leave them all compressed for the weeks in between your camping experiences. You're gonna want your sleeping bags ready to go. So this is, a, this is a good best practice if you have the space. Here's a good example of storing a sleeping bag inside of a big laundry bag where it could be nice and fluffy 
instead of leaving it inside of its compression stuff sack or even an uncompressed stuff sack. You really want to have the slipping bag free to keep its fluff while you're not using it over long periods. Sometimes sleeping bags even come with a big bag as opposed to its little tiny uh, transport compression bag like this down bag that I've got shown here. I would never store this bag inside of a little compression sack in the long term because it would probably get damaged being such a small space for months or weeks on end. So I think that beating sleeping bags to death here, all in all, there's a lot of different ways to make it work. Like with everything else, if you have an opportunity, practice first at home to make sure that you have your system dialed in. And if you can't do that, make sure you have a backup plan just in case things go south on your campout. Or north, I suppose. South is usually associated with warmer. Camping!